Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess it's it's definitely afternoon in the east. It's maybe just barely afternoon on the west coast. And if you're further into the Pacific, not quite. Thank you for joining us. I'm Andrew Selingson, president of Campus Compact. I'm joined today by my colleague, Emily Boddy, our director of development. Hello, Emily. Hello. And uh, we really appreciate your joining us to talk about the Safe Elections Project and how you, in whatever roles you're in, can contribute to successfully recruiting the poll workers that our country needs to have successful elections this fall. So we're going to go into a, a great deal of detail about uh, what that's all about and why it's important and why we're involved in it and how you can help. Beforehand, let's just get started with Emily uh, sharing some housekeeping notes. Sure. So thank you all, as Andrew said, for taking interest in this issue and taking the time to join us today. Uh, first and foremost, we are recording today's webinar and we will be sharing the link. So if you do need to drop off at any point, feel free to look out for that recording. We'll send it to you. Um, we also are in a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So you're all automatically muted and your cameras are turned off, but that does not mean we don't want to hear from you. Uh, there are two ways that you can interact over the course of this hour. So the chat functionality can be used to speak with each other. You can introduce yourselves um, and have any conversations you deem relevant in there. And the Q&A function you can use to ask questions for Andrew and myself. And we'll leave plenty of time at the end of the hour to go through and answer as many of those questions as we can. So please don't be shy. Feel free to use both of those functionalities to connect with one another. Thank you, Emily. And in a moment, Emily is going to review uh, our agenda and then we'll jump in. I did just want to say a little bit at the outset about kind of how we at Campus Compact think about our work generally in the election space and in particular with respect to this project and poll workers. For us, uh, the same set of values that compels us to work on behalf of racial justice and more equitable communities, the same set of values that motivates our belief in the full participation of everyone in all aspects of political, economic, social, cultural life, that also motivates us to work on behalf of elections in which everyone can participate fully uh, and have their voice heard. It's essentially grounded in a, a belief that every human being has equal dignity and equal worth, and that as a consequence, no one has any inherent right, no individual, no group, to rule over others without their consent and participation. And we see elections as one important way that we realize that value in practice. And that's why we seek to educate students about electoral participation and uh, encourage them to engage their peers. It's the reason that we are involved in this project that's about ensuring that every American has meaningful access to the ballot. And in this case, it's really about ensuring that there are enough polling places. And we see a special opportunity this year to engage young people, the rising generation, to take responsibility and indicate to the world that they take these issues seriously. I think we've seen a lot of evidence in this in all sorts of domains, that young people are paying attention, that they care. And this is just one more way for them to show that, that they can lead in a moment when they are essential. So that's why we're in this. And as we said, we're about to dive much, much deeper into what the, the poll worker issue is about in 2020 and how you can be involved. Great, so let's start with an agenda for this call so you all have an understanding of what we're gonna talk about. So some of the questions that we aim to answer for you today. We'll start by explaining what poll workers are, what they do, why they're important, and why we need to recruit them this year. We'll then tell you about the Campus Compact Safe Elections Project, how it came to be, what it's been up to so far, and what our goals are between now and election day. We'll then share how you can support efforts to recruit poll workers in your campus community. And we'll share some resources that are available, um, both Campus Compact resources and those from our friends and partners in the space. And as I said before, we'll leave plenty of time at the end to answer your questions. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in since we have a lot of exciting stuff to cover. 
And to kick us off, I want to make sure we all have a clear understanding of what we mean when we're talking about poll workers. So terms are also used to describe these folks, including election judges, election workers, clerks, and officers. For the most part, these terms are pretty interchangeable. Um, we at Campus Compact tend to use the phrase poll workers. But as you're having conversations in your campus community or with your local elections office, you might hear them referred to by one of those other titles. Um, just know that we're all basically talking about the same people. And those are dedicated citizens who show up in person on our election days to support our election processes in roles like tabulation, setting up polling sites, and much more, which we'll go into on the next slide. The thing to know is that poll workers are the essential workers of our elections. They are critical to making sure that our elections run smoothly and making sure that every voter has a positive experience casting their ballot and letting their voices be heard. So to make sure we have a clear understanding of why they're so important, I thought I'd share some of the key responsibilities that poll workers have on election day. So poll workers are the people who show up at their local polling place, set up the voting station, and answer voters' questions as they're coming in. They check voters in and distribute ballots, ensuring that everyone receives the correct ballot. They help elderly and disabled citizens vote, providing that extra level of support that some of our friends and neighbors require. They update people's voter registration information and in states that have same day registration, they actually register people on the spot so that they can vote. They're the folks who maintain a safe and orderly polling place, which we know is going to be more important this year than ever before with the additional sanitation and social distancing practices that will have to be implemented. Importantly, they're the ones who pass out the I voted stickers that we all know and love. And at the end of election day, poll workers ensure that everybody who's waiting in line to cast their ballot when the polling place closes is actually able to vote. They then break down that polling location and ensure that all the ballots make it safely to be counted. Now, this is a high level list. There are certainly more specific duties that poll workers have, but this should make it pretty clear that without poll workers, our in-person elections can't happen. They cannot function without a solid staff of these poll workers in communities across the country who can make sure that every community member is able to safely and in a positive way cast their vote. So that's all great. But now we have a problem, which is that most poll workers are over the age of 60. In fact, usually 56% of our poll workers are 60 years or older. And this is exactly the population that's at the highest risk for COVID-19. So understandably, when they're looking at election day and thinking about sitting indoors in a public place, interacting with hundreds or maybe even thousands of people, many of those older Americans are opting out this year in order to protect their health, which we understand and that makes sense. But it does have serious implications, which we already saw earlier this year during primary elections. A few examples, just to make sure we all have a sense of what this looks like. Washington, D.C. lost 1,700 election workers during the primaries this year. In Georgia, many of us saw on the news the images and videos of those lines that stretched for hours because reduced and understaffed primary polling locations caused voters to have to choose between waiting in line for hours to vote or if people had to choose to go home or they had to go back to work, they were disenfranchised, their voices were not heard. In Anchorage, Alaska, 95% of past poll workers declined to come back to work the polls this year. And Kentucky had to consolidate to a single in-person polling place per county during the primaries due to poll worker recruitment concerns. So that's a really serious problem. And that all happened this year during our primary season. And now we are just about 60 days from our November election. And nationwide, we're facing a critical shortage of poll workers to work on election day. 
So in order to combat this problem, our in-person polling locations will require up to a million poll workers. And we're now less than 70 days away uh, to recruit and train all of these people to make sure that our polls are staffed appropriately, minimizing those long lines, to ensure that technology functions properly and efficiently, to help neighbors in our communities across the country navigate issues when voting, and to prevent election administrators from closing polling places altogether. So that's the problem that we as a country are faced with right now. And Andrew, I'll turn it to you to share our solution. So at Campus Compact, we decided we should spring into action. Uh, we found others on the funding side and, and partners who were interested in helping us make that happen. And we've been focusing our work in three ways that are kind of uh, sequenced. So the first part of this effort, which has been going on across the summer, has been engaging student recruiters in the work of mobilizing their peers. And that's based on experience that probably many of you share that the most powerful voice to mobilize any group are peers within that group. And we certainly see that among students. And because students are so important and younger people in this effort, we started there. And so this summer, Campus Compact has engaged 300 student recruiters across the country to help take action to, to get their peers informed, engaged, and ultimately enrolled to serve as poll workers. And many of you uh, helped us spread that word and we appreciate that. Our member institutions were crucial in helping us connect with students who were interested in this opportunity and ready to go. Uh, they had the opportunity to earn a stipend of $500 and to use their personal networks, their student networks, their campus relationships to engage students. Uh, and the results so far have been really exciting. And so maybe I'll, I'll uh, spill that number. So I think we are, Last time I checked, we, we can actually see it in real time. We're very close to 3,100 poll workers that have been recruited through Campus Compact's efforts this summer, and a huge amount of the credit goes to those student recruiters. And again, to those of you who also helped us get connected with them. So that's part one of the effort, and it's ongoing, and it's really important. The second piece has been mobilizing partners. We've been reaching out to other organizations, who have relationships with students, with young people, who share our values and are interested in getting the word out. And again, these don't have to be people we agree about everything with. We, we think of uh, recruiting poll workers as something that ought to unite all Americans, anyone who cares about free and fair elections. And so we've had others who have been sharing word about the importance of this effort, connecting with students, and that's been really helpful. And now as classes are coming back online, well, I guess literally online in many, many cases, but uh, in some cases with students on campus, in other cases online, and in still other cases, some mix. And I guess a fourth category is some that are starting one way and are turning into others. And I know all of you are dealing with all of that craziness, but it creates the opportunity to engage staff and faculty who are now interacting uh, much more with students to, to ask you to help us share, share this information, spread the word, let students know about the importance of poll workers, let them know how they can get involved and, uh, and really help make this happen uh, all across the country. So that's again a little bit about what we've been doing and a key dimension of all this work uh, that's been done again by these students from more than 100 colleges across the country uh, is helping people find their way to the URL that is on that slide, powerthepolls.org slash campus. And I will repeat that and Emily will repeat that and we will have you dreaming that URL uh, before we're done because that is the, the entry point for poll workers all across the country. So Power the Polls is a partner of ours in this effort and they have set up this portal so that students can go in and others and use that URL, say, hey, I wanna be a poll worker, and then receive follow-up from local elections officials. One of the complexities of all of this, and we'll get more, more into this, is that in each state, and in some states in each county, the rules, the processes, the procedures differ. So there has to be a point of contact with local elections officials, but the starting point 
to simplify the process is just going to powerofthepolls.org slash campus, signing up. That gives the local election officials an indication that you're interested and you're from their community, and that's how this works. So most of this is happening virtually. We've had students presenting in virtual classes about this opportunity and the importance of serving, collaborating with student groups and academic departments, leading social media campaigns, and in all other ways that they can think of that we might not have. We've seen some great uh, videos that students have created and other creative ways they've been engaging, getting the word out, and again, driving their peers uh, to powerthepolls.org slash campus with an understanding of why it's so important for them to do that. Absolutely. So just to touch quickly on Power the Polls, in case any of you missed it, yesterday was National Poll Worker Recruitment Day, and Power the Polls was the leading voice behind this. We saw organizations and celebrities and elected officials all sharing this tool, and it really speaks to how important they've become in this poll worker recruitment space. So we're thrilled to be an official partner. So Power the Polls is an initiative to recruit a new wave of poll workers, especially young and more diverse populations that historically have not filled those roles to ensure a safe, secure, healthy, and fair election for all voters, which of course is exactly in line with our mission and part of why we're so excited to work with them. So we just wanted to share a quick screenshot of the portal Andrew was just speaking about. So if you were to visit our unique URL or just the main Power the Polls site, they look exactly the same. Uh, so powerthepolls.org slash campus will bring you to this site where you'll see it's a very simple form that we're asking students and other young low risk individuals to sign up. Um, and then as Andrew said, they'll be connected with their local elections office. So it's really simple. Uh, we encourage you, if you haven't already, to take a look at this site. You can look through the FAQs and the About page to learn more um, and see us among the list of many, many exciting partners uh, that are coming together for this effort. Now, we also thought it would be helpful, now that we've explained the problem and our part of the solution, just to make sure you all had some clear, high-level talking points of why people should be excited about becoming poll workers, so putting that positive spin on it. So first and foremost, in almost every state, poll workers get paid. Now the rates differ depending on the city or town, and in some places it is a volunteer position, but almost everywhere, poll workers are paid a daily rate for election day, and in some cases they're also compensated for any training that is required before election day. So that's a great incentive for people who are looking for a little extra income. As we said before, when there's a shortage of poll workers, we see polling places close. And that in turn leads to an overall lower voter turnout, which we all want to avoid. When polling places close, people have to travel farther away to get to their local place, uh, which brings in transportation, childcare, time off work, all of those issues that can prevent uh, people from having fair access. And when more people are being funneled to a single polling location, we see those lines grow longer and longer. So it's pretty clear to see the correlation. As long as we have enough poll workers, we will not see that lower voter turnout. Poll workers are also the people who make sure that every voter has a positive and empowering experience when they are casting their ballot. And when younger Americans step up this year to fill in these roles, they'll be protecting an older cohort of Americans who are just at higher risk for COVID-19 and can't serve this year. And lastly, poll workers ensure that their community's election and results process is smooth and efficient, which as Andrew said, every American uh, should be excited about this and know it's in each of our best interest uh, to make sure we have enough poll workers this November. So a few high level key messages just for you to have in mind as a recap of what we've talked about so far, as you're having conversations recruiting young people to serve as poll workers. So the problem is that we have a national poll worker shortage. And the solution is for young people to sign up and serve as poll workers and they can register to do so at that URL, powerthepolls 
org slash campus. I know you're all halfway there to having it memorized. The job, so being able to share at least a high level um, explanation of what poll workers do, some of those key responsibilities so people understand what the day would look like. Sharing the perks that poll workers are usually paid and they protect our democracy and being transparent about the risk, which this year, of course, is COVID-19. So you should always keep these messages in mind when having conversations about why someone should serve as a poll worker. All right, so now let's turn it over to you and talk about what each of you can do between now and November 3rd to help ensure safe elections for all. And Andrew, you can kick us off. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to start with, we know that we've got um, folks in different roles uh, joining us today. And so we're going to be talking through, uh, you know, from the perspective of those different roles, what are some of the things you can do? And some of those overlap, some of those are kind of complementary, like encouraging people in some other role to do a thing that isn't as uh, good a fit for your role. One of the things I want to say before I kind of jump into that is just that, you know, um, Emily mentioned the, the opportunity we have to engage younger people, not only to serve this year when they're needed, but also to become the people who routinely are poll workers. And I think this is a really important part of this. We all know that our election system in the United States isn't good enough. And in my experience, one of the best ways to cause a thing to get fixed is to introduce a whole bunch of young people to how messed up it is and let them start putting pressure on the rest of us to start to get it right. And so I think the opportunity to say this ought to be an intergenerational responsibility where we learn from each other. Uh, that's a real opportunity this year. And hopefully even when we are no longer facing pandemic conditions, some of the people who get signed up this year will choose in future years to stay engaged. And I think that's one of the reasons there's so much value for people in, in all different roles to contribute to this effort right now. It's a huge opportunity moment. So let's jump into some of the things that faculty members can do to, uh, to help meet this need. The first thing is uh, tell a story in your classes. So in some cases, you may be teaching something where there's a direct relationship. You may be teaching courses in political science or sociology or education in other areas where there's a real link to educate to uh, elections or public policy. And so saying, hey, a link in that chain is having an election process that really enables the public to participate and express its views that's an important part of the process and here's a way you can contribute. So in some cases there might be a direct link, but I would also say, even if you're teaching a course on medieval literature or you know, quantum physics, take advantage of the fact that you have a captive audience. Uh, all of our students are in college in part to educate themselves in, in the ways uh, that they can contribute as citizens, as members of communities. And I use citizens in a broad non-legal sense as people who are parts of communities. And so taking advantage of your platform to share with them a really important way they can contribute, that, uh, that matters and that's appropriate. The second thing, as I mentioned, you could in incorporate it directly into your own course, but also you can share with colleagues how it fits into a broader curriculum that you're teaching, whether in your own department or in others. Uh, in that way, you can mobilize your department to open classes up to presentations. There may be faculty members who aren't themselves comfortable talking about this, they don't feel as informed. Maybe you or some students who are engaged on this issue can come to classes in your department, uh, show up on the Zoom if it's, if it's online, and just give a couple minutes about this, share the URL, let people know about this opportunity. So you're helping to open up space for students to do that or to do that yourself is really important. You can amplify the efforts of student recruiters on your campus. As we said, we have recruiters on more than 100 campuses who are spreading the news. It, we can help you find out who they are, and you can do things like retweet their messages or share videos they create, uh, direct your, you know, uh, you know, quote them in emails that you can send on to a faculty list. So you can take their voice and help it uh, reach a broader audience. And you can encourage institutional leadership to enact policies allowing students to miss class on election day if they are serving as poll workers. Uh, we're seeing this happen at institutions. In some cases, it takes action by a faculty committee that's empowered to do it. In other cases, uh, there can be a senior administrator like a provost who uh, issues a policy. 
It's something that our board of directors has called on all colleges and universities to do. And so one of the really important ways you can open up space for students and reaffirm that your institution is committed to the value of fair and free elections is by helping to push forward a policy that would enable students to serve as poll workers and know they won't be penalized if they miss class. All right, so that's a little bit about faculty. Uh, there are also people uh, joining today who serve in staff roles, and I know some of you are in both, so you can uh, think about those overlaps. So one thing you can do as a staff member is to help activate faculty networks. If you are working in a civic engagement center or otherwise um, in a role that, that helps faculty members get connected to civic and community engagement, letting the folks who already care about those issues know about this need and about the things they can do to inform students, helping them do it or providing them with information uh, as appropriate, that's, that's a role you can play and it can be very valuable. You can encourage colleagues in uh, various roles to integrate this message into student programming and to share to student lists. So if you're positioned in student affairs or if you're in academic affairs and there are uh, you know, lists of majors and departments, you can try to encourage your colleagues who are in a position to do so to share this message through programs they're offering or to just get the word out in that way. You can encourage student leaders to share the message. So if you're working in some setting where you're, you have a cohort of student leaders who you work with, whether as employees in programs or volunteers, whatever the, the case may be, you can help inform them and figure out ways that they can communicate with their peers. If there are program orientation events happening or other kinds of uh, early year events right now, this would be a message that you can share. Um, various kinds of lists that you're on or social media from your office. Uh, that's another way to get the message out. And then, you know, one thing that can also be very valuable is, again, especially if you're in a civic engagement or service learning role, coordinating with colleagues to identify someone who will be a liaison to local elections officials. We know this is a complicated year where many of your students may not be physically where your institution is, so this, this will apply in different ways to in different places. But the idea of saying, hey, we want somebody who can give us information if it's relevant about uh, you know, changes that are happening in elections procedures or other kinds of things like that, uh, it can be really useful if there is somebody who can be a conduit to the campus for good information about what's going on with local elections officials, as well as letting the elections officials know about your efforts to enlist students as poll workers. Great. Now I want to share a few things that students can do in case we have some students on the call right now or if you're just thinking about the students that you'll be interacting with over the coming weeks. Um, so of course students are the target population to actually sign up to serve as poll workers. So the most impactful thing they can do if they're able is to sign up at powerthepolls.org slash campus to serve as poll workers themselves. But when we're thinking about what students can do to amplify this message and bring even more of their peers into this initiative, some things they can do include presenting in classes. This might be working in tandem with faculty to do a co-presentation or just asking for a few minutes of time in their own classes or others um, to jump in and share about this important work uh, just for a few minutes. Students can also ask faculty to encourage their colleagues to allow space in their classes for such presentations. So really making sure that all of the faculty know that this is something that your campus cares about, that you and your fellow students are passionate about, and just spreading the word to try to get as much uh, collaboration as possible. We found that students who are presenting to student organizations and student groups have been incredibly successful. They love having those more in-depth peer-to-peer conversations. So whether that's in person on campus or in a virtual setting, reaching out to the huge list of student organizations at your campus and asking for their assistance in having space at meetings, promoting through newsletters and social media, and just other exposure to their audiences is a great way to amplify this message. And of course, students are pros at social media, so encouraging them to 
post, come up with creative new content, as well as share content that's been created by us and our other partners, such as Power the Polls, the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition, and all of the fantastic celebrities and elected officials who are working to promote this message. Uh, there's a lot that can be done. And as we've seen with our student recruiters, getting creative and thinking about your relationship to your campus, where you go for news and updates and opportunities, making sure that those are the spaces that you are hitting first um, to help spread the word as wide as possible are some really fantastic steps that you can take as a student. And just to reinforce that, we at Campus Compact are obviously extremely cool, but it's possible that the folks that the NBA and Comedy Central and whatever have gotten to share this message are slightly cooler and that can be amplified through various social media efforts. I'm, I'm not sure about that, I just think it's possible. Uh, Emily's obviously offended legitimately. I am a little offended. <laughs> uh, so senior leaders on campuses can also support these efforts um, and their voice obviously can be very important. It, it cuts through often to uh, a whole set of populations on campus and makes really clear what the institution values. So if you are a senior leader or if you might be able to get the ear of one, these are a couple things they can do. The first one, you know, I've mentioned earlier, enacting policies, enabling students to miss class without penalty on election day. That can be very important. And again, I think uh, students, we have, we have good evidence from this in research literature, they take signals about what really matters and what the institution's real values are by actions the institution takes rather than just the words. And so I think that can be a very important way to say to students that the institution genuinely cares about student participation in elections and about everyone's participation in elections. And then the second thing I think can be really valuable is for senior leaders to amplify the efforts of student recruiters on your campus. And if you're in a staff or faculty role, you might be in a position to help make those connections. So if a president is retweeting messages that students are sending out or otherwise sharing them, the president may not know who the student recruiters are, but if you can help them find those accounts or whoever manages the president's social media account, help them find it, that can be, again, a real way of saying the president is genuinely behind this, the institution is behind it. The same could be true for you know, uh, a vice president for student affairs or academic affairs or others with a lot of visibility on campus. And as we said uh, earlier, and this is just kind of the, uh, the official uh, statement of it, uh, our board of directors uh, thought this was sufficiently important. They, they often, as, as a board that's mostly college presidents, they tend to be a little bit reluctant to tell their colleagues to do anything. Uh, and this was a case where they really thought it mattered and that they wanted to call upon their peers across the country to enact policies that both actually protect students who are doing this work, but also um, that symbolize the value that colleges and universities across the country place on access to the ballot. Great. So as we shared, this is now a little bit old. We've recruited nearly 3,100 new poll workers through our initiative so far, which has only been live for about five weeks or so, which is incredibly exciting. And as some of our student recruiters are wrapping up their time with us, they've been sharing in their final recruitment log some of the activities they found to be most impactful. So we just wanted to share those findings with you. Of course, unsurprisingly, social media is far and away the easiest and most exciting way for these student recruiters to spread the message in their campus communities as well as their personal networks. They found that being able to share specific information about local elections where they live as well as this national shortage has been a great way to engage a huge audience. Um, and they've gotten a lot of direct messages and comments from their friends and classmates and surprising people who are excited to learn more. Um, they've also shared with us that those presentations in classes and student group meetings even if they're virtual, have been really fantastic. People have smart, insightful questions. They're excited to learn more and to sign up. And just having that support of faculty um, and the student group leaders to provide them with the space to share this message has really reinforced to them that this is an issue their whole campus community can rally around. Uh, they've also shared that, unsurprisingly, personal one-on-one -on -one outreach to their friends and family has 
led to some really interesting deep conversations around our elections more generally, as well as the poll worker shortage. So just empowering them with the tools and the language to go out and pick up the phone and send a text or make a phone call to let people know, hey, this is a cause I'm really into, I really care about it, would you be willing to learn more? Those conversations have yielded fantastic results. So as we've said to our student recruiters, I will share with all of you, please don't be shy. As we've said a few times already, it's in every American's best interest that this election is fair and safe for everybody. So don't count anybody out. Um, it's worth reaching out and seeing if people in your network are willing to have the conversation. Maybe they themselves can sign up to serve as a poll worker, maybe not. But even if they're not able to serve, they might be able to help amplify the message to their own personal network. So we encourage you to spread this far and wide. Uh, the last thing I wanted to share is that our student recruiters have found it super helpful to know if poll workers in their community get paid, and if so, how much. Uh, so being able to tell their classmates exactly what their compensation and expectations would be to serve as a poll worker on election day has been critical in their recruitment efforts. So we encourage you to look that up where you are as well. Now, we shared these reminders with our student recruiters, and I wanted to do the same now, that there are four critical points that we at Campus Compact at least have identified that we think you should remember as you're going out into your campus communities to recruit young people to serve as poll workers. And the first is a little obvious, but worth stating, which is that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. So even though COVID-19 is the reason that we need young people to step up and serve, it's still a huge risk and obstacle, even if it's lower risk for that population. So we definitely recommend that all recruiting methods be virtual to keep your own health and safety as well as others um, top of mind. And we also encourage you to be sensitive to the fact that even among younger populations, many will not be able to serve as poll workers because of various factors. Maybe they live in a house with an older person who's high risk. Maybe they live with someone or they themselves have a compromised immune system, and so they're higher risk than they might outwardly present. Perhaps they're not eligible because they're registered to vote in a different state or they're not registered to vote at all. Or maybe they are at the lowest risk you could hope for but just aren't comfortable. And all of those reasons are okay. We're not in the business of coercing or guilting people into serving as poll workers against their comfort. Uh, we're just trying to spread the message to as wide an audience as we can. Second thing to remember is that efforts to recruit students and other young people to serve should go hand in hand with nonpartisan efforts to get out the vote. So many of you are on this call in part because you have been involved in those get out the vote efforts and using the same networks, the same communications channels, the same organizational partnerships uh, can be an effective way to get the word out, but it also can be two messages that you are sharing simultaneously, that two things that young people should be thinking about this fall are participating as voters and helping others to participate by serving as poll workers. So uh, again, we, uh, yeah, so there's a, there are very, you know, I'm just thinking about this because I saw in the chat somebody asking about international students. There are lots of ways for people who can't legally vote or can't legally serve as poll workers to still be helpful to peers by sharing information about all these things. Um, but the more those things are coordinated and it's a clear picture about the importance of young people's participation in elections, both as voters and potentially as poll workers. Uh, the, the last thing, or the, the next thing, I guess, I just uh, signaled a moment ago as well, which is uh, this effort, the Safe Elections Project, is a nonpartisan effort, and we encourage you to recruit in a nonpartisan fashion. For us, obviously, uh, this is partly motivated by the fact that we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're legally required to proceed in a nonpartisan way, and many of you in your roles at your universities have the same uh, restrictions. It's also true that we just think this is a nonpartisan value, that the value of participation in elections is not owned by any particular party or perspective. It's uh, common to all of us. And it, we think it's best for everyone to approach poll worker recruitment in that way. So we suggest that you not connect any messages about endorsements for specific 
parties or candidates with your poll worker recruitment efforts. And we also suggest that you not target or exclude any groups because of their political affiliation. So reaching out to both student Democratic and Republican organizations, for example, and asking them to join together in encouraging poll worker participation. We think that's both effective and also consistent with the kinds of values that are motivating this effort to begin with. Great. And then the fourth thing that we want you to remember is that the rules, requirements, and protections for poll workers vary everywhere. And that's because these decisions are made at the state or even at the local level. So things that you might be considering, such as how old poll workers have to be, if they have to be registered to vote in that city or just in the state or in general, um, if there's a party affiliation requirement, um, those things are all determined at the local level. Additional things such as how long of a day poll workers are actually serving. Can they work a half day or do they have to be there while the polls open all the way until closing time? If and how much they're compensated, and especially this year, what if any personal protective equipment will be provided and what safety measures will be implemented by the local elections office both to protect poll workers and the voters at large. So all of these decisions are made locally. So I wish that we could sit here and provide you answers, but we can't really do that. What we can do, however, is help lead you in the direction of where you can go to find those answers. And the tool that we highly recommend is Work Elections, and that website is workelections.com. So it's the same folks who created Power the Polls. Um, it's a really easy search functionality. So you can visit this URL and search for your city or town to find out all of the poll working requirements and that local information that you're probably curious about and people you'll be in conversation about uh, poll worker recruitment with will also be curious too. So you certainly don't have to become experts on election policies in order to help further this effort but having at least a basic understanding of the local election rules and happenings where you are can help you answer common questions, work efficiently, and speak from a position of knowledge and authority. And here's just a quick screenshot of the Work Elections website. So you can see really easy to select your state, then it pops up, you type in your city or town, and you find out all of the information that you need. Okay. I think I stole a slide from you, Andrew. I apologize. <laughs> but now we wanted, to just, <laughs> we wanted to share a few resources for you all uh, to keep in mind. So of course, as we've said a few times already, Power the Polls, um, our custom URL is powerthepolls.org slash campus. This is just our custom URL so that we can track in real time how many people are signing up through our efforts. It's exactly the same site as if you went to just powerthepolls.org or any of the other custom partner URLs that you may see, such as from MTV or Comedy Central. So even though campus is in the name, that's just because our name is Campus Compact. It's not exclusive to students or higher education. Anyone can go to that URL to sign up to serve. Uh, Work Elections is that second site that we mentioned where you can find out all of the local information that you might be wondering, as well as the contact information for your local elections office. So as Andrew said earlier, identifying a liaison for your campus who can make a connection with that local office and let them know what sorts of recruiting efforts you're doing on campus, and that can be really helpful. We also created a Google site, which I have the URL here and we can share in a follow-up email as well that houses some logos and graphics, as well as a lot of the great uh, content that our student recruiters have designed over the past month or so. We have FAQs, some best practices and others all in one place. So we'll make sure you have that link. The Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition just in the last few days came out with a poll worker recruitment toolkit designed specifically for college campuses. So we will share that link too. And then lastly, just wanted to share the website healthyvoting.org. Uh, we're sure that many of you are considering the health and safety effects of COVID-19 for our election this year. So that can be a great way to find out local guidelines, what's happening in your city 
or town um, and find out just all of the answers that you might be looking for. Andrew, over to you. Can't hear you. Got so far into this without talking while muted. I thought I was going to make it all the way. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, follow accounts that are actively recruiting poll workers. Um, and so here are some of those. Um, Power the Polls, uh, which we've talked about. Uh, the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition, which is also an ally in this effort. We've been doing a lot of this from our Twitter account. Um, we also have seen a lot coming from uh, state and local elections offices, so you can check in your, your place what's, what's going on there. And then there's a, if you follow the hashtag Power of the Polls, you'll also see um, a lot of good content coming from MTV, The Daily Show, Comedy Central, etc. So people are really good at producing content and calling attention to this issue. Uh, so that... Uh, is some of that information. I was in the middle, I'm, I'm just gonna to be totally honest about this, I was in the middle of copying and pasting the Google link that people asked for. So I got uh, <laughs> thrown off my game there. Uh, okay, we'll share that. <laughs> excellent. Uh, all right, so I think we are now up to the point of the exercise where people can ask questions. You can do that in the Q&A. Uh, as Emily mentioned, we'll also, I saw some questions coming in in the chat so we can scan those. But I think it's easiest if people put them in the Q&A box and we will definitely see them there. Yes. So while people are doing that, should we just call out a few from the chat? That sounds great. Okay. So I see you've answered some, but in case not everybody was looking in there, we will share the recording of this webinar after the fact and you are welcomed and encouraged to share it with anybody, your students, your peers, anybody. So that's great. Um, yes, again, about the recording. Uh, volunteer with no pay. In some places, at least, you can sign up to be a poll worker or serve in some sort of volunteer capacity without opting into being paid. Um, some roles like greeters, sometimes translators are needed. Um, so that would depend on your local elections office, but I would encourage you to look into who they're looking for. Um, in case people are able to volunteer without signing up in an official employee type capacity. Okay. And I did, I'll just flag, I did put that uh, link to the Google toolkit, uh, recruiter toolkit that Emily mentioned earlier. That is now in the chat. So if people wanted to be able to just uh, click it, it's in there. I see some of the challenges that schools are facing right now are that students are being asked not to leave campus to head into the community. So I would just say one thing and then Andrew, feel free to jump in. Um, hopefully your school, if that is the case, has one or more polling locations on campus. So finding out what the poll worker needs are for those on-campus polling locations and how students can step up. If they're not going to be able to leave campus to vote, there should certainly be additional polling locations made available and making sure you have plenty of people to keep them open would be my personal suggestion. Andrew, anything else from you on that? I mean, you know, the only other thing I would say is, um, I think this is one of those situations where focusing on the, the opportunities we have. So I think most campuses, even if some students are on campus, many students are remote and wouldn't have those same restrictions on being out in the community. So you know, thinking about how to reach the students who are in a position to serve, recognizing that yes, because of restrictions, either local restrictions, university restrictions, some students won't be able to. Yeah. I see a question in the Q&A. Uh, poll workers have also contributed to lots of voter suppression. Can this also be a motivation for students to sign up as poll workers to avoid this? Um, so I think the facts about that obviously vary significantly from place to place. Um, but I think insofar as one thing that students can do is be people who bring uh, the value of poll participation to the work of being a poll worker, that, that hopefully should be everybody's motivation to enable access. But I think the idea of saying to students uh, that they can ensure that everybody is given the access to vote, uh, absolutely, that's an important motivator. And if there are local histories 
that involve voter suppression coming from, uh, from officials, then yes, taking the place uh, in order to be able to ensure fairness and access, I would think that would be uh, an important message to share for students. Absolutely. And in some places, they have requirements that there be an even number of poll workers from the two main political parties to try to minimize bias in one direction or another. So that's not true everywhere, but something to consider as well. Another reason why a nonpartisan and bipartisan effort is so critical. Um, someone mentioned in the chat that in New York City, they're recruiting translators and those positions don't require that people be registered to vote, which is fantastic. So yeah, look into who they're looking for in your area uh, to make sure we have all of the support roles filled that we need. Um, there was a question about other activities such as phone and text banking, et cetera, which is great. So in the Google site that Andrew put the link in the chat, we do have some templates. So those can be used for emails, for social media posts, et cetera. Um, and then we'll continue to add things that our student recruiters have been creating to that site as well that you're welcome to reference. So if you're encouraging people to do a phone bank and you're looking for a little script, um, we can certainly make sure to have some language in there for you to use as well. Great. Don't any see any, any other questions yet, but if people have anything else, uh, you should certainly feel free in our last few moments. Oh, somebody did ask um, how to find out if your campus has a poll worker recruiter that you can contact. So our email addresses are here on the screen. You can email me. Um, I've been managing this project, so I've got the full list of our student recruiters, and I'm happy to put you in touch. We let them know in their application process that we might share their information with folks from their campus or partner organizations to help assist in their efforts. So happy to make the connection for you. Great. Any last thoughts, questions, ideas that you want to share with us or with your peers in the chat? Please feel free to do so. Yeah, and if not, um, you can certainly, as, as Emily said, follow up with either of us. Um, Emily knows many more answers than I do, but I'm always happy to give it a shot or just to forward it to her. Um, and our email addresses are right there on the screen. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time out to join us today. Um, again, many of you have already been helping by helping us recruit recruiters. And so, uh, you know, everything that you have done and also just your willingness to think ahead to ways you can contribute, we really appreciate it. Um, and I just think, you know, we do have an opportunity together to help demonstrate the, the real commitment of younger Americans uh, to the core values of a democracy. And I think that's a really important message uh, given the context we're in now. So the more we can help with just building up those numbers and showing that this generation is taking responsibility for ensuring access for all of us to the ballot, uh, I think there'll be huge payoffs. So thank you uh, for your role in that. Yes, thank you all. Thank you for the kind words and support. And please don't hesitate to reach out with any thoughts or questions that come up after today. Best of luck, stay safe and healthy out there. We hope to see you again soon.